Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Produce Buzzers Podcast. We are so happy you have joined us today, and I think you will be too after the show is over, because you will learn a lot about fresh fruits and vegetables, how to select and store them, how to prepare and cook them, and surprising facts about their history and origin. We hope it inspires you to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, not only for your health, but also for your delight and pleasure as you explore their amazing world of taste and delicious flavors. Eating more of them will transform your life in so many positive ways. So settle back, relax, and get ready for another delicious adventure with the Produce Buzzers. Greetings, fruit and veggie fans, and welcome to another delicious episode of the Produce Buzzers podcast. I'm your host, Edwin Stepp, and executive editor of ProduceBuzz.com. I am joined once again by Teresa Nolan, founder and president of Produce Buzz, along with Rick Stepp and Cynthia Benedetto, contributing editors to Produce Buzz. Today, we are going to look at a side of the fresh fruit and veggie business that most of you probably don't hear much about. That is the legal challenges that confront growers, shippers, wholesalers, and retailers selling fresh produce. I think you will find it interesting and marvel at the dedication and perseverance of the people who bring you your fresh fruits and veggies as they face the monumental challenges in the supply chain. Today's guest is an attorney who has dedicated her career to helping those heroes of your fresh food navigate the legal minefields inherent in such a perishable commodity. Katie Kestner Esquivel has over 15 years of litigation and advisory experience in the produce industry. She has earned a reputation for being a fearless, thorough, and aggressive advocate for her clients. Add to that her experience as a woman and a mom, as well as her perseverance, grit, and determination, and you will understand why Katie has been able to build a very successful law firm that has helped people and businesses in the fresh produce industry. Katie opened her firm in 2013, just after her son was born. At that point, Katie realized that traditional law firms were not well suited to meet the needs of working mothers. So after a brief break from maternity leave, Katie decided to break the mold and create the work environment that she wanted. On November 1st, 2013, Esquivel Law Chartered opened its doors in Naples, Florida, and Katie has never looked back. Katie, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Edwin, thank you so much for having me. Tell us more about why you decided to focus on the fresh produce industry in your career as opposed to other parts of the legal profession that you could have chosen. Well, I think that uh, like we've all experienced at one point or another, we make great plans and then God laughs. laughs. Um, certainly when I graduated from law school, if someone said you're going to be representing uh, members of the produce industry and uh those that arrange for the transportation of produce, I would have said, what is that? They didn't teach us that. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I, I certainly didn't expect this, but I couldn't be more grateful to be where I'm at today. Um, when I first graduated from law school, I worked for a commercial litigation firm for three years. So we did everything that walked in the door with the exception of family law and criminal law. And that gave me a lot of great experience with hearings, trials, depositions, litigation, but it's a very adversarial day-to-day, all day, every day, you're battling with people. And after a while, I realized that I was having a hard time turning that off when I left the office at eight or nine o'clock at night and decided (laughs) that I needed to, you know, see what else was out there. And when I did that, I found a firm that uh, represents produce growers and sellers, uh, same area of practice that I do now. And the beauty is that those proceedings are either in the federal courts or in front of administrative agencies. And so much of that work is done based upon written papers. And I have the opportunity to use the same litigation skills that I earned in my early years of practice 
but um, the, the, the tenor of the work is far less litigious. It is um, something where when I'm in depositions, I enjoy it because I'm not doing it every single day or having, you know, for a week um, yeah. and trials are not very uh, frequent. And so I really enjoy those experiences when cases arrive at that point, if they do. And um, so, so that's so the trials in, the, in your, in your business and produce industry, they settle, or it's not trials, but cases settled a lot out of court um, b beforehand or mediated and uh, some, in some way, rather than going to full litigation. Is that what? That's correct. That the yeah. vast majority do settle before trial. Yeah. yeah, right. That's good to hear, generally. Yeah. <laughs> so you're working for this firm and uh, learning a lot about the produce industry and the business of it. And then tell us more about it, your inspiration for starting your own firm. Or, Well, I, as you mentioned in the uh, intro, I um, had always wanted to have my own firm. I always wanted to be my own boss, but always came up with a thousand reasons why. I was afraid. I thought people would laugh at me. You know, the fear of failure is, is real, as yeah. <laughs> many of us know. And then when my uh, son was born, I, it quickly became clear that the traditional law firm environment was no longer a good fit for me. Yeah. And I needed to have the flexibility to do my work how and when I wanted while still being able to care for my son and um, do the things that I need to do as a wife and a mother, as well as an attorney. Yeah. And in starting my own firm, I was able to work where I want, when I want, um, you know, I can work from noon until midnight if I want, or I can work from nine to five or right. whatever that looks like in a given day, depending on what's happening. Yeah. Even though the, even though uh, oftentimes when you have your own business, it's, you know, you're on call 24 seven, but you do have that flexibility more. You can shift it around. There's no uh, partners or bosses saying you got to be here now. And then uh, is that only judges. Yeah. Oh, only judges. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Only judges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're right. The the responsibility is huge. Yeah. You know, we it's absolutely huge, but the trade-off is certainly worth it. Right. That's great. Well, uh, congratulations on that. And and uh, uh, those initial years uh in uh, starting your own firm, I imagine were uh were were not totally smooth. There were probably a few bumps in the road, right? But <laughs> there's there certainly were. And when I first started my firm, I was a true solo. And so it was, you know, a one woman show. If the copier got broke, I had to call <laughs> to have the copier fixed. Right. Um, you know, if I, I remember a time um, when my son was sick and he couldn't go to daycare and I had a, a contract that needed to be finalized and sent to a client. So I went to grandma's house and you know grandma took care of my I think he's maybe four month old and uh, I went in the spare bedroom for a couple of hours with my laptop got the work done you know worked through the edits with my clients and you know felt very fortunate that I had the flexibility of doing what I need to do as a mother and a parent while also being able to service my clients the way that they deserve to be serviced and with that level of quality. Yeah, that's great. So uh, how long did it, when did you first start adding partners or other associates? Did, you, did that come quickly or? I hired administrative staff probably about three years in and I had a secretary um, who did, you know, help me with a lot of the of you know administrative secretarial work which that alone was a huge help for me and then yeah. in uh 2011 I hired a full-time paralegal who also has a law degree and then in uh, last summer I also hired a full-time legal assistant and right now we're looking to hire another full-time lawyer and a paralegal as well. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, let me back up a little bit because I, were, have you always lived in Florida, the Naples area, or did you? 
grow up somewhere else. I'm originally from East Lansing, Michigan, uh, oh. the home of the Michigan State University Spartans. Right. And uh, my grandfather was, uh, he grew up on a farm in Michigan. And um, I uh, grew up in Tampa, Florida. My family moved when I was in grade school. Okay. And then when I was in college at the University of Florida, they moved to Naples. And I started coming here during vacations, during college. Never in a million years did I think I would settle down in Naples. <laughs> I thought it was boring and the streets rolled up at nine o'clock at night and there was nothing to do in your twenties and <laughs> had every intention of moving to Chicago. So I uh, obtained my Illinois law license the year after I was admitted into Florida and then ended up never leaving Naples. So <laughs> I met wonderful friends. I met my husband and ended up putting down roots here and, yeah. Here I am. That's fantastic. And you survived the Hurricane Ian okay? Or we how did. Was we, it? Were, yeah. we, were, we were so incredibly fortunate. I, I don't know how we were so lucky, but yes, yeah, thank you. Right. Could have been, you never know which way they track, but. Uh, it, it, it's that. And, you know, sometimes it's just blind dumb luck. Uh, you yeah. know, we have, we have neighbors who, who had tremendous amounts of loss and we, for some reason had a tree down, yeah. you know, it, comparatively nothing. Right. So we I were went, very fortunate. I went through one in Vero Beach. I used to sell grapefruit for ocean spray, uh, uh, grapefruit. And uh, Hurricane Aaron in 1990, what would that have been? 1995, I guess. I can't remember. 95, I think. Came right over Vero Beach. And the eye passed right over. But it was unfortunately just a uh, category one. So it didn't do a tremendous amount of damage. We survived it. But it was pretty scary, even though Hurricane won. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So uh, tell us about your clients, what they do in the world of fresh produce, and how do you help them? My clients are some of the most interesting people you will ever meet. Um, when well, they're in the fresh I... produce business. We know that already. <laughs> <laughs> well, with your experience, you certainly do. But when I first started working for the produce industry with my first job doing this, I was absolutely amazed by how interesting the clients were. Um, you have, my clients are growers or they are wholesalers of produce. Um, that means either they're growing the commodity, whatever it is, or they are selling it to um, someone, a middleman somewhere between the farm and when it ends up on my plate or in my refrigerator or on our plates in a restaurant and um they the people are interesting it is a industry that's origins were based on handshakes yep. on trust <laughs> on your word is your bond and your honor and I think this industry out of all of them has had a really difficult time shifting to, oh, wait, we need to, con we need to have a written contract. We need right. to memorialize these agreements in writing. And um, I've had the privilege of helping people do that. And I've also had the really uncomfortable um, conversations with people saying, hey, listen, you know, the person that you thought you could trust wasn't really so trustworthy and right. here's where we're at and you know here are our options moving forward that that's so, a really interesting observation that's something i had not thought about um I, rick Teresa, and i grew up my father our father had a fresh produce business he grew apples he grew uh vegetables in western north carolina and had a pretty big packing house and packed not only his own products but products for people all around the area Okay. And I don't think he had an attorney, did he, <laughs> Teresa? <Rick. laughs> uh, occasionally, he might have to call on one for something, but yeah. he didn't have like he wasn't involved in. But that, that I don't contracts. think there were any contracts, not one no. contract. Now he he did he, have issues though in in New York with uh, PACA, with uh, uh, some wholesalers in New York not paying. 
Uh, he had uh, to go through PACA to collect. I think in the fresh produce business, most of the people are ethical and upstanding, but in every business you have the problems. And what can you tell us about that? Uh, is is uh, in, in the produce industry, is there how widespread is the litigation and the complaints and the, the time it's, is it, is it a major problem or is it just come up occasionally? <laughs> well, I, I think there are disputes that happen every single day. The reality yeah. is that there are going to be disputes. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be heated debates. Um, you know, every single day that occurs in the produce industry, yeah. the question becomes, well, what's the most cost-effective way of resolving that? Right. And the majority of the time, the most cost-effective way, the fastest way, is for the parties to work it out between the two of them. Right. And depending on the relationship between the two parties, if it's an established relationship, sometimes they may say, well, you know what, I'll, I'll agree to something that I don't really think is 100% fair now because my relationship with this other party is worth it in the big picture to my business. And yeah. I want to maintain this relationship and people come up with, with great solutions between them all the time. Yeah. Um, usually lawyers are involved when there is an, an issue of non-payment and that's something that sellers generally have a limited ability to handle on their own. Um, certainly not in the legal system. They have very limited ability to handle it on their own. And then um, if there is a contractual dispute, you know, what were the terms of the contract? Here's what I think they were. Here's what you think they were. Yeah. And um, what I see oftentimes is that produce companies will take a contract from another, you know, trading partner from five years ago change a few words and everyone signs it and nobody has any idea of what it really means or <laughs> what they intended it to mean and that's when people like me get involved right <laughs> yeah i've i being in the having a television production company for many years you know we were uh, especially i produced documentaries primarily and our budgets were you know notoriously low so we found ways to cut corners and we would go and get boilerplate contracts and just use those. But those, those can get you in trouble really quickly. Oh, so, they can. So you learn the hard way on those things. But, well, that's interesting. Do you have any, uh, are there any stories you can share that are more specific about some uh, problems, how they resolved, either happy or maybe contentious? <laughs> Well, um, I know you can't talk about your clients and give away confidential information, but if the no, is... <laughs> no, I, 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 there was um, a case that I was involved with that, yeah, and, and this is an example that I use oftentimes to highlight the importance of having a written contract, whether you're in the produce industry or whatever business you're in, or if you're hiring someone to work on your house, um, it's important to have the terms documented, whether it's an email, a text message, you know, it doesn't have to be a 15 page single space contract, but a basic document memorializing the terms of the deal is critical right. in this age and, and time. Um, I had a client who uh, was work, he is a grower's agent, which for our listeners is a, what he does is he works with a farmer the farmer grows a crop of products. So let's say uh, tomatoes. And his job is to sell this entire tomato crop. Mm -hmm. And uh, the farmer in this instance decided that they did not want to spend the two or $3,000 to get a lawyer to draft a contract. So they did it themselves. And the grower decided uh, about midway through the season that he was going to start selling some of his tomatoes to a company that he thought he was going to be getting better money from. Mm. And so he deprived my client of those sales. 
And we ended up litigating for probably three years, spending far more than the amount at issue over um, the the dispute. My client did prevail, but you know this that is an instance of being you know penny wise and pound foolish. If they had just spent the couple of thousand dollars on getting a nice contract that could be used again and again, they he would not have been in litigation for several years, which yeah. is significantly more expensive and stressful and time consuming. Right. Um, and why did it have to last several years? The court system is incredibly inefficient mm-hmm. is really the, the answer to that question. It is very inefficient. Um, mm-hmm. In order to take a case to trial, you need to obtain discovery. You need to find out um, testimony from witnesses. You need to obtain documents from all of the parties. Um, with that case, um, there were allegations that the grower wasn't properly, he, he was sending his best stuff to a very high end retail chain and then giving all the junk that was left to my client to sell and then claiming that my client was doing a lousy job selling. And so, you know, interestingly with that case, we got the best evidence from talking to the farm manager who said, you know, walked us through their handling practices after the tomatoes were picked. They clearly demonstrated that the way they handled those after harvest was absolutely inconsistent with industry standards for maintaining freshness, for making sure that those tomatoes had as long of a shelf life as possible. And those were all the things that were able to give us great information to not only prove our case, but the farmer in that case actually countersued my client. So we not only won our case against them, but their case against us. Okay. Does it matter that if it's a short crop or a long crop? Um, in that instance, it did not, but sometimes it absolutely can. I mean, there are disputes regarding was something an act of God? You know, if, 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 if a grower has already contracted in advance of a season, they've got a, a you know, however many acres, they allocate a certain percentage to different customers. And let's say there's rain. Well, let's say there's hail. Um, anything can happen with weather. Mm-hmm. And the crop, the yields are down by half. What are the farmer's obligations to which of these customers? What are the farmer's contracts with each of those customers? Um, ordinarily, the farmer would be required to allocate whatever's left on a percentage basis with each of those customers, but that can be changed by contract. And so um, all of those things can make a difference in the outcome. So in, in legal in, in the legal world, an ounce of prevention is worth probably a ton of the cure, right? <laughs> and not Without a, a doubt. <laughs> Without a doubt. And, yeah. and I see my job as to help my clients create strategies and business um, processes so that they don't need me. You know, yeah. they need me when there's a really serious problem, but they don't need me, you know, once a month. Right. I, yeah. I like to talk to my clients about the weather and what's happening, not about the problems <laughs> that they're having. That's good. That's good. Well, let's go back to what you were saying about the, the, how weather can affect things, you know, fruits and vegetables are not widgets and, you know, no. and, in other industries, uh, you know, you could just turn up the manufacturing and fulfill those orders to whoever needed them. What does some degree, but in the fresh fruit and veggie world, you're at the, we're at the mercy of mother nature and some other things. And th- there's a lot of factors that can de- determine the quality of the fruit or vegetable as it arrives to the grocery store shelves or the wholesale market. Uh, once harvested, they're on a race against the clock to avoid spoilage. 
Uh, they have to be maintained at just the right temperature and humidity. <laughs> so me, it's a real yep. miracle that they make it to the grocery store shelves at all. But tell us about the challenges in that transportation side, which you said you also fo focus on for the growers and shippers. I do. And um, the, you know, the transportation is a, is a critical element of it. Um, the getting produce from the farm to, let's say, your local grocery store or the grocery store's distribution center, you know, depending on the commodity, you may want a specific type of tractor trailer. I have a client who grows strawberries in Plant City, Florida, and when they ship their strawberries, they require the tractor trailers to have a certain type of suspension system because if the berries are going beyond a certain geographic distance from their farm because the vibrations of the road uh, as that tractor trailer is moving down the highway all those clamshells of berries are vibrating down yeah. the road if those are going say from florida to say boston they're going to be in a very different condition after sitting on a tractor trailer subjected to you know those extra forces than if they're going 100 miles away yeah. and so especially like on that, the roads in the northeast uh, there's so exactly <laughs> but haven't exactly. haven't the the um technological advances in tractor trailers hasn't that made a huge difference it does in the sense that when, so when you're transporting produce, uh, the equipment that's used is, is oftentimes called a reefer. And that's a refrigerated or temperature controlled trailer attached to the tractor, which is the front part of the, of the semi, the right. motor carrier. And the technology is fantastic in knowing the GPS location. There's been recent legislation and changes that require GPS monitoring of the vehicles um, that track driver data, track driver hours on the road. Um, you know, if, you know, they even sense the forces, if there was rapid acceleration, deceleration, say the driver slammed on the brakes at one point, the data is all, it's almost like a black box. All of that is there and available. Um, things like suspension is a little more nuanced. And that is the product, when I was talking about the strawberries, that's the product of that same grower having a bunch of loads of strawberries arriving in Boston and being rejected because they were lousy quality. And finally figuring out over time, hey, listen, it's the suspension. So I need to make sure that the equipment has this specific suspension. Yeah. And not all tractor trailers have that. Not all reefers have that. Um, many motor carriers are contracted either through brokers, which is a third party that the grower would hire to find a truck, or the grower may have relationships with carriers that they use on a regular basis and who know that that grower or shippers specific needs, but things like suspension are not necessarily universal. Mm -hmm. And so um, while there are a lot of things that are, and that are, are completely different than they were even five years ago, um, many things are, like that are, are simply the the product of trial and error and figuring out, oh, wait, I can save a lot of money by implementing this one new requirement. That's interesting uh, about what the black box, as you call it. I, I was aware of the new regulations that came out a couple, few years ago, and I thought it was mostly about for safety. And I think that it was uh, to make sure the drivers are only driving eight hours and they're off eight hours and other things. But it never occurred to me, and maybe this isn't possible, but that information could be used to uh, to provide information to you and your clients about how that was transported or not? Is that available oh, to you? Would that absolutely. only become available in a discovery for a trial? Or can you, every time our load arrives, no. you can check that information? 
Um, it primarily ar arises in the context of there being a problem with the load at the yeah. time of delivery. Right. So, for example, I was working with a client who a, um, a, a load of watermelon, and watermelon are packed in these big cardboard bins that are referred to as combos, and those are set on top of a pallet, and they're full of watermelons, and the tractor trailer arrived, and all of those combos were tipped towards the cab of the truck, towards the back of the trailer. And the question was, well, did the driver slam on his brakes or did the shipper do a lousy job bracing those combos when the shipper loaded them into the tractor trailer? Hmm. Who's responsible? And hmm. so um, with food safety uh, rules and regulations being what they are today, it is increasingly common that drivers are not allowed on the loading dock to see the product being loaded into their truck. They are, you know, because the shippers need to maintain, you know, very strict policies on who has access to our food. Interesting. You know, if the if the driver can't see what's being loaded, then it's the shipper's responsibility to make sure it's properly loaded. And in that particular instance, working with the carrier, working with their insurance company, we were able to get all of that data that showed that there were no hard stops, starts, you know, that the there wasn't, you know, swerving to avoid a child or, you know, right. avoiding hitting something. And we also were able to learn that that same uh, shipper had had a couple of similar instances. So we were able to really quickly learn that it was a shipper problem, not the responsibility of the carrier who transported those watermelons from point A to point B. Well, you mentioned food safety. So I'd like to come back yes, to that but, because I know that's a big, uh, that's a big question. There's a lot of talk about it. Um, what is being done in the industry to ensure food safety and preventing contamination from your perspective? Well, there's a tremendous amount. Food safety benefits everyone. And I think that the stakeholders in the industry want food safety. They want practical and um, science-based measures that will ensure food safety. It makes sure that their customers are comfortable buying their products. Um, but also, by the same token, we all need to be mindful of the fact that you're dealing with produce. Most of the time, it's grown outside. Growers only have so much control over what can be exposed to that crop. Um, you know, for example, the uh, I think it was the, one of the first big um, contaminations about 10, 15 years ago with, I think it was spinach, that turned out to be the, the problem was wild boars that were somehow getting into the farm. Mm. And, 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 you know, growers with thousands and thousands of acres, it's impossible to really control every single element, every single thing that may come in contact with that crop. And so, I think it's a very, very difficult for particularly larger growers to maintain food safety and security and, and mitigate every single risk. It's right. just not practically possible. And when we have a society that is growing by leaps and bounds, we're fortunate enough to have a country that grows enough food to feed us, there is an inherent risk involved with that. And that means that sometimes there is going to be contamination from one source or another. Some of them are easily preventable and others are not. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it's, to me, um, lawyers certainly don't give the issue a very good name. Uh, you know, you see these ambulance chasing lawyers who, you know, sue everyone for every outbreak. Sometimes I think that's well-founded when 
you know, simple preventative controls, say in washing or post-harvest handling can mitigate that risk. And other times I think, man, you know, how foreseeable was that? Was that something that that grower could have seen? Probably not. Yeah. And um, I think it's it's a tough question. And the but, one the one point no. that I remember from uh, my uh, food technology class was if it got into the root system, then it became like you could wash that all day long, and you know again like that that and. You can't freeze. Not going to take it out. Washing you can't freeze milk. milk. Right. Yeah, that's the only two things I remember from that course. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, it's a I, complex. I, go ahead. But go ahead. I mean, like a little bit of common sense seems to go a long way, and maybe we're lacking. Yeah. Right. Uh, common sense, as people like to say, is not so common anymore. It seems. And on that note. Let's switch to another hot topic that is bearing down on the produce industry and creating some pressure for farmers, growers, and shippers. Uh, there have been a lot in the media over the last few years about food spoilage and waste in the produce industry. How big is that problem? What is being done to mitigate it? Are you involved in, in, this, uh, in this issue at all? Well, it's something that as a consumer, I certainly pay attention to. Um, yeah, I'm the primary person who buys food in my household. Mm -hmm. And so I pay attention to sustainability. I pay attention to um, the environmental impact that my purchases have or don't have and um, try and strike a, a reasonable balance there. When I see the media reports about food waste, one of the things that I don't think is really being conveyed clearly is that those numbers regarding food waste include the um, losses that automatically happen, the waste that happens anytime you're growing a crop. Yeah. So regardless of if, whether it's today or if it was a hundred years ago, when a crop is grown, there's gonna be some of the crop that's rotten. It's no good. It's got bugs in it. That's all counted in those numbers when yeah. we see these reports of food waste. Right. That's going to happen no matter what. Then you are also going to see things like, you know, waste that's the result of weather. It's not just that these companies don't care and have a desire to waste food and to waste produce, these numbers, in my opinion, are skewed in a manner that does not make them meaningful to the average reader, right. because it doesn't explain that in any crop, there is going to be a certain amount that is not marketable, that cannot be sold. And there may even be a situation where, let's say for that commodity, um, let's say it's apples, maybe everyone had a great apple harvest that year and the market is so flooded with apples right. that it's more expensive to pick the apples than it is to leave them and letting them rot on the tree. Yeah. Those are economic business decisions. They have been made since the beginning of the agriculture industry in this country. And so to pat, I think that it's, it's, misleading to package that up as being an example of food waste right yeah i think you're absolutely right i do think those figures are blown out of i even saw today somewhere 40 percent of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables go to waste but i i'm very suspect about that and i you know anybody who's ever had a garden you know when tomatoes come in in your neighborhood and all your other neighbors try giving those tomatoes away <laughs> You and that's a great example because that's, <laughs> yeah, right. that's what happens. I mean, yeah. depending on what's happening with the market, those are the business decisions that growers are making right. as they should. 
Yeah. But they are also getting people, but they are hats off to the industry though, because they are trying to find solutions and, you know, to work with the food banks and all of that when it becomes too expensive to harvest the other people who are willing to come in and help them. And they're making a lot of progress, which I think is, is important. We shouldn't just ignore it and say it's not there, but uh, hats off to the, to again, the people in the produce industry for doing that. So, and, <laughs> and, and I agree there with you. There is no uh, game in Las Vegas that is more <laughs> risky than being a farmer. Right. <laughs> and right. you're betting on the weather and all kinds of things coming into play. Yeah. But <laughs> Teresa, didn't you give the suggestion to a retailer that um, to put the kiwis in the fruit, um, in the salad bar? to help mitigate that shrink? Uh, if I did, it was before Alzheimer's had set in. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa, I'll remind you of all the stories. <laughs> well, we're running out of time here, Katie. I know you've got probably got a busy, busy schedule, but- uh... well, I, I do want to just pick up briefly on oh, what please, Teresa please. said, yeah, because- yeah. I really think that that, uh, Teresa summed it up right there. And that's been really one of the most interesting things for me is learning about where our food comes from. And it, through my work, I've had the privilege of, of understanding everyone that's involved from the time someone even thinks about growing a crop until it ends up in my stomach. <laughs> and the farmer is the person with the most risk in the game. Right. And as a country, I think it is really unfortunate that most people don't understand how much risk farmers have in growing a crop. There are so many variables that they can control, but so many more that they cannot. Right. And they oftentimes have hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in a crop. And even with crop insurance, you know, I'm in Florida, there's hurricanes, you know, there are all kinds of things that can occur that can devastate that crop and potentially put that grower out of business. Um, and a couple of bad deals or not getting paid for some of their product or working with someone who's dishonest in selling their produce. You know, these are the people who truly are, in my experience, are gen tend to be some of the less sophisticated um, people in the, the food supply chain. And they're unfortunately the ones with the most risk. Wow. Um, in, in what I do with the collections work, I remember there was a big uh, wholesaler out of New Orleans that was closing its doors and they owed I don't know, probably five, $6 million to its produce creditors. And so we were getting calls from everybody who had supplied this company with produce in the past year and wasn't paid. And I remember talking to a farmer, um, really, you know, salt of the earth, really, really nice gentleman. He was, you know, probably in his seventies and the laws are written so that, you know, if you don't dot an I or cross your T as a produce seller, you don't get these really special predator friendly remedies. And he didn't know what he didn't know. He was mm -hmm. used to a handshake deal. He right. was very old school he was used to delivering his sweet potatoes to this company and getting a check a couple months later. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking with him and saying, you know, because you didn't send this one piece of paper within 30 days of delivery with this magic language on it, sorry, you will be at the back of the line to get paid. And the assets of this company are not going to be enough to pay everyone. Right. And I just remembered like this really long pause and thinking, oh my gosh, this poor man who's worked his whole life in this business and this one, you, you get one bag of egg 
in it and it can devastate someone's life, their livelihood, their family's livelihoods. And so to me, you know, really respecting our American farmers is critically, critically important and is sorely lacking in our national narrative. Mm -hmm. That's a good message, I think, to end on. Uh, well, it's point. really, but yeah, we're not <laughs> ending yet. But uh, thank you for that. And uh, it is something we have to keep in mind. Um, now, I think Teresa, if I'm guessing, is going to uh, uh, entertain us or either sorry, punish sorry. us. We're apologizing. I'm with... apologizing for us in advance. I can't sorry. wait. This sounds great. With a segment. <laughs> Am I right, Teresa? Is it time for home grown? Grown. I don't yeah. know if you listened to an episode, Katie, with a homegrown, but this is our little segment where Teresa, Teresa loves her puns. Sometimes, well, no, no, they're never good. They're never funny. They, we, that's why we call it homegrown, because we groan at them at the end. But have you got one for us today, Teresa? I do. And, and okay. it's, it's, it's a legal question. So. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Well, All let right. me introduce it. Let me introduce okay. it. Okay, Produce <laughs> Buzzers podcast fans, it's time for your favorite segment on the Produce Buzzers podcast. Yes, it's time for home grown. Uh... Teresa is going to pun issue with a pun. Teresa, what is the home ground? Okay. On what grounds was the Georgia farmer able to get a crow arrested in his orchard? <laughs> okay. So I don't know if we told you, Kay. We, we, we try to guess these first before she uh, yes. gets the answer. So, the okay. So on what grounds was the Georgia farmer able to get a crow arrested on his farm did i get that right in his, in his orchard in oh his in his orchard. orchard okay so any guesses out there of crow in an orchard uh, i feel I like it's somehow helping the crow steal something in the orchard i feel <laughs> like the, i feel like the crow i feel like the scarecrow was involved Scarecrow. There you go. That's probably something. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, close. No, and that see, and I'm thinking the ground in which it was grown. Uh, I'm thinking oh, like, you know, that's pretty good. Pretty good, <laughs> Cynthia. <laughs> I got what it. grounds was it? Uh, the Georgia Orchard. That's uh -huh. the ground. Peach. Something with a peach. Something with a peach. I'm well, guessing. a group of crows is called a murder of crows. Was it That's oh. right. the grounds of a oh. murder of crows? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good, but Edwin's getting very close. It was. I, I've got, I'm sure it's something to do with a peach because it's a Georgia <laughs> orchard, but I don't, I can't get the, uh, we'll let you tell us. Okay. All right. The, the Georgia farmer was able to get the crow arrested in his orchard for disturbing the peach. Oh, oh, that, that's, that's awful. I always laugh. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, Rick never groans. I never no, groan. I I, they're always funny. <laughs> I'm going to tell you one thing before you before you give me the boot. No, well, you can stay around me. as long as you want. By the way, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no, I I I had a client who was um, selling product for a farmer in Georgia. And, you know, while mo much of what I do involves federal law, it, I occasionally stumble across random state laws. And uh, I learned that my client, who was a sales agent, he was selling the product grown by this Georgia farmer. He and the farmer had a disagreement about how much the farmer was owed. So the farmer marched down to his local police station and filed the police report. Because there is a random Georgia law that says that if a farmer is not paid for all of his product, and, and what that amount is, is pretty subjective, that an arrest warrant can be issued. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> so my <laughs> client's packing up his stuff and hightailing it past the state line uh. to get, because 
He was afraid of an arrest warrant being issued because of this disgruntled grower in the state oh. of Georgia. <laughs> but it's a little known remedy that many Georgia farmers have that, you know, yeah. they may not be aware of. <laughs> That's a true story. A true story. I promise oh, you. Wow. Hand That's to God, a it is a true story. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, Katie, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. You I'm so not much. giving you the boot. I would keep, you know, if you want to keep talking, we'll keep listening. But I figured you got a busy day. So it's been a pleasure having you. And uh, thank you again for joining us. You, uh, thank you. Have enlightened thank us. You. I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed being here. I listened to the podcast uh, before being on here. And right. you've got a you've got a great dynamic here. And I really appreciate the opportunity to meet everyone and to be a guest on your show. Okay. Thank you Bye. so Thanks, much. Katie. Well, thank you listeners for tuning in to the Produce Buzzers podcast. Brought to you by Produce Buzz, a gathering place for lovers of fresh fruits and veggies. We hope you were entertained a bit and educated a lot about fresh produce. Be sure to join us next time, and please tell your friends to do so as well. Like, share, and comment on our Produce Buzz Facebook page. And check out our website at www.producebuzz.com. There you will find articles about fresh fruits and veggies, how to select, store, and prepare them, as well as lots of interesting facts about all the wonderful bounty the earth provides for us. Until next time, be fruitful, and don't forget to veg out.